welcome to All Set for Sunday, a uh, cast for <laughs> podcast for busy and distracted Catholics to be a little more prepared for Sunday Mass. My name is Scott Williams. My co host is Jeff Trailer. Hey, Jeff. Happy Easter, Scott. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen. Hallelujah. 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 Ding dong. Hello, Father Patrick Hyde. How are you? I am wonderful, Scott and Jeff. Happy Easter to you. To you as well, Father. Hallelujah to you. Amen. Yeah. Do you and your Dominican uh, brother priest do anything fun and exciting out of the ordinary for Easter? Uh, I don't know what you mean by that, except for go to a, celebrate a lot of masses and do a lot of work. I was uh, yeah, say, yeah. What do you do after that? Celebrate though? into exhaustion. <laughs> uh, Monday, you do, get the day off, and now we're back at it, and uh, if just working, working for the weekend. You know what I mean? Yeah, just hard <laughs> no. Got it. Everybody's working for the weekend. <laughs> See, we do in fact work for the weekend because if we do yes, good yes. work Monday through Friday, more people will be there at Sunday when it really matters. That's good. right. No, but no, uh, no Easter celebration at the, uh, in the, what do you guys call it? Is it a record? Quarters? The well, technically the our houses or... are either called, it depends on the size of our house. We either mm-hmm. call them a house or a priory, uh, oh. but our house, What's yours? ours is a house because we don't have enough brothers to be a priory. How many square feet require priory status? It doesn't have anything to do with the number of square feet. It has to do with the number of brothers simply assigned there. And so in order for ah. a priory to exist in the Dominican order, there have to be at least six solemnly professed brothers assigned there, four of whom are priests. Oh, oh so you have to hit ratio. You got to get ratios too. Mm-hmm. There. Correct. What do you guys have? Yeah, I thought you'd have We that. have. Uh, we technically have six right now, but we just passed that. And then there's a whole process you have to go through in order to do to get to priory status. Do you get an extra tax credit or what? Uh, well, governance wise, it is actually advantageous. So a priory that's why, is that's why you're working on it. Yeah, no a priory. <laughs> so, for instance, every four years we have what's called a provincial chapter. A priory gets at least one delegate, the prior, and then one associate we call associates who goes with him. And then, depending on the size, you can get more. So, a priory that has twenty men will get three delegates as opposed to one. Um, and so it does, but like as a house, you're not guaranteed any representation at a provincial chapter. So, so in terms it's like voting of, status, things like yeah. that. What's it? And then you're talking Dominican Tea Party. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're just doing great things for the Lord Jesus and his church. That's awesome. So, so you're officially applying, applying for priory status? Uh, the, the conversation has begun. Ah. But it's a keep a your whole cards process. close to your chest. Mm-hmm. Your provincial might be listening to this. So hmm. well, there's, it's completely out of any of our control. So ah, oh, you don't like apply? No, no. Oh. I mean, I guess you could technically, but we we've at least asked for the conversation to be started, and that conversation has started. Got Great. It. All right. Well, Congratulations. This is big time. I, I, you know, I'm a good conversation starter. What can I say? <laughs> you, you are that. That is that is true. All right. We ready for the two minute drill? We're ready. It is the second Sunday of Easter, also known as DM Sunday. DM <laughs> slide into your divine mercies. Uh, divine Mercy Sunday, uh, which is exciting. Like it's always Divine Mercy Sunday is always a great little like it's Easter. This is exciting. Then you're like, oh, and then you get like bonus. <laughs> Gets this, even better. I know. Just when I thought. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, this is Divine Mercy Sunday here. Uh, our first reading comes from Acts chapter four. So in Acts, the early Christian communities are, um, they're, we're talking about how they're of one heart and mind. They share everything they have. They care for one another. Uh, they testify to the resurrection of Jesus with great power. And that because of all of these gifts, there's no, no one is needy among them. They distribute their possessions. They share. It's a very idyllic world that's happening here in uh, early Acts. That like we're all in this together. Yeah, he is risen. We're excited. We're just gonna we're just gonna do all the things he said we should do, and it's really great. Um, our responsorial psalm is give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love is everlasting. Uh, I was I was like at or, banger status right until it got to or everlasting because in my mind it's uh. His love endures forever. Mm. I don't know why that was sticking in my mind. But because of that, I would say, or. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
So I'd say if you're listening to Music Masters, just hit the Alleluia this week. That one's long. It's probably going to be a mumbler. People are hype. People know Alleluia. Just they know that. the words. They just let. They just. It's just one over and over again. You have the right to Alleluia. Yeah. You got to fight for your right. Well, Jesus fought for your right. Yeah. Hallelujah. Um, and then our second reading comes from one. You know what I love about the two minute drill when we have Father Patrick on that he's either not entertained or not listening. I don't know which one it is. He may we may be on mute. I don't know, but it, it's his, oftentimes his, both. If you but that's watch how my brain YouTube, works. It's oftentimes both. <laughs> I got in trouble all the time at school for not listening, and it's like that. My I, I still know what's going on better than half the people in here. I don't know how my brain works. <laughs> like I'm smarter than works. Jeff, so I already it's not read that these I'm smart. readings. I don't it's need to that, listen to his dumb stuff. You know. Uh, no, you just go with this blank stare and I'm like, cool, this is great. I'm really, it's the only feedback I get is your face on this podcast. I have been told that I have a, uh, a, a disposition that often looks like I'm murderously raging at times. You have a so. resting monk face. That's what, yeah. you have. <laughs> That's what I'm going to call it. Okay. I love that. RM. <laughs> oh, that's oh. great. All right. Uh, our, our second reading comes from uh, the first letter, John. Uh, so John is emphasizing the importance of faith in Jesus. We all know that. Mm -hmm. And that that's the source of uh, our eternal life. And then he says that believers are called to love God, keep his commandments, and that uh, with with faith or in with faith, they can conquer the world if they do that. If they love him and keep his commandments and hold their faith, um, that they can conquer the world. And he affirms that Jesus is the one who came by water and blood, not by water alone, that we have to bear witness to the truth of his divinity. Water, blood, divine mercy Sunday. Hey. Was it uh who did we have come visit here one time that called him uh we had we had somebody one time, Father, who was taking a tour and mm -hmm. they saw uh the divine mercy socks on the sock machine and they called him Squirty Jesus, which I thought is a really great description of divine mercy mm -hmm. image. So that's yeah. one description. That is one, yes. Anyway, all right. No kind of gospel. I think that's what their kid called it. To... Yeah, it was a kid. That's what yeah. I'm talking about. I would not like a grown adult. Come on, <laughs> it wasn't me. All right. Uh, our gospel then. Gospel is John chapter 20, 19 to thirty one. This one's a long one, folks. Everybody, hang on. Settle up. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, "Peace be with you." When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you, are, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord. But when he said to them, or but he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my fingers in the nail marks, I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your and bring your hand and put it in my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, "My Lord, my God." Jesus said to him, "Have you come to believe because you have not or because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed." Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. Is that it? That's yeah, that's it. All right. All right. Very good. Great cast. <laughs> good cast. <laughs> oh, goodness. Father Patrick Hyde, did Jeff get anything wrong? I don't know if it was Why wrong. Why a deep breath and an eye roll before So like... to speak, but he did tell a story that was clearly about a child, but it sounded like he was talking about an adult. The squirty <laughs> Jesus thing. Like, it sounded like an adult... <laughs> Like a 45 year old man was walking through your factory and said that, which was really weird. But then yeah. you said it was a child. So not wrong, but maybe not the best way to tell a story. Listen, we do have a 45 year old man 
to here who calls all of our images really interesting names because he didn't grow up. He's not Catholic, but he's learning. So shout out Chris Coker. I'm sure he's a listener. <laughs> all uh, right. So no heresies, just, just, just no, misspoke. no heresies. No, okay, good, great. Good, they good. were, That's they good. were, they were material, not form. Father Patrick, what are you preaching on this weekend? Also, what is the, you get a little little glass espresso cup? Espresso that is amazing. Um, this is actually my favorite gospel to preach on the entire year. Oh, Ooh. okay, that's exciting. That's just and a little chip shot because for you. The, the second Sunday of Easter, we always get uh, the story of Thomas. And uh, Jesus coming, we get the gospel, or we get the Easter uh, appearance of Jesus to the apostles in the upper room in the gospel of John. And the thing I love about this uh, gospel and preaching on this gospel is that Jesus manifests who he is through the fact that he is still wounded. Okay. Uh, And... When Thomas has doubts, what does Jesus do? He has him put his finger in his holes in his hands and his hand into the hole in his side. And this is, I think, is such a powerful image for us because one of the things that often inhibits us from following Jesus are the wounds that we carry from our sinfulness, but the sinfulness of others. And so we see ourselves as unworthy or unqualified, or as broken and thrown away because we've fallen into a particular sin or struggled with a particular sin for a long time, or we have been uh, on the receiving end of the woundedness of other people. And yet, what does Jesus do? He shows that in his glorified body, he still bears those wounds. And I often did connect this with in uh, the epistle of Peter. He says, by his wounds, you were healed. You were saved. And it is in those wounds and the fact that Jesus, because the glorified body is the, is the it's perfect. It's There's no veil, so to speak, between the divinity and humanity of Jesus. Like, there, you know, before his glorified body. So when he, this is a choice. The glorified body, in a way, can because there's no physical limitations because he's trans he's transcending all of that yet he chooses to have those marks on there as a reminder to those of us but also as the means by which we are saved the marks of the nails and the the lance and conceivably even the marks of the lash or the marks of the crown of thorns they mark the body the glorified body of our lord and so he takes our wounds He suffers and dies for those. He rises from the dead, and he shows us the power of our own wounds in that they have no power except to be transformed and to be the thing through which we can give glory to God. So the reality is, is like what gives glory to God? How does Thomas recognize the divinity and the humanity of Jesus? It is in the wounds that are not foul and festering, but that are still there, but are glorified. So too for you and for me. In a way, we always bear the marks of our wounds, especially when we fall into grave sin or when something grave is done to us. We never lose that. It's always, in a way, a part of us. There's a scar, if you will. But in Jesus and in his resurrection, we can find new life, and we often find true freedom and true new life, not in spite of, but through and because of our wounds. And so actually what Jesus is inviting each of us to do on Divine Mercy Sunday, but every, you know, which is always the second Sunday of Easter, is to come to him and to show him the wounds in my heart, the wounds in my life, the wounds on my soul, so that we can be saved, so that we can be healed. So do we, you were talking about this, and it's a very good point that we see, obviously, like Jesus risen from the dead. He doesn't. Like if he has those wounds, it's intentional. It's to show us this, right? It's to, to, to make this known. But I, d- I don't remember, and maybe, maybe it's just my like the lack of depth I have. But I don't remember like imagery, of not like there's pictures of this, but like imagery of Jesus resurrected with the wounds. Like I guess there there are images that depict like Thomas like touching the wounds, but mm-hmm. like when I think resurrected. You know, I think so. Im- images of the resurrected Jesus. I, I mean, again, maybe yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying they don't, 
But I think this is a really good point that like it like it shows that like in his perfection and divinity, he is also he's still imperfect, right? He's still wounded, like you said. I think that's interesting. I wouldn't I say know. imperfect. Not imperfect, that's but, yeah. but he chooses the brokenness of humanity. Right? He he maintains he he to, in the glorified body, the body that is eternal, that will never perish, he he bears those wounds to show us that it is only through accepting our woundedness and bringing our woundedness to him that we can be healed because any other um idea religion uh, uh something in this world to which we take our wounds there may be some sense of healing but it won't be an eternal healing and in fact the things that we think of it often that are broken are what actually bind us more closely to Jesus, but also to our fellow human beings, mm -hmm. right? When Thomas sees those wounds, he sees not only the glorified body of God and comes to believe in this mysterious uh, resurrection, but he also sees the means of his own salvation and the means by which everyone else will achieve salvation. So he becomes closer to everyone else, right? You know, the, when we see the wounds of Jesus, that's the first thing he does. He show, he says, peace be with you. How do you know peace? You look and touch the wounds of Christ and you bring him your own wounds. And you do that in communion with the church, not on your own, but with each other. Now, when God willing, we get to heaven and in our glorified bodies, we wouldn't necessarily have the wounds of our past or we, we would have what we would conceive to be perfect bodies, right? Well, there's, Jesus there's a chooses. question there. What, what does it mean to have a perfect body? Hmm. Six-pack abs. <laughs> More so like, like a our keg, bodies, right? yeah. No one will recognize me. <laughs> our bodies will not be limited, but then we have to ask ourselves, is the, is the glorified body of Jesus limited? No, he walks through doors. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, he has these marks, and yet he walks through doors, and yet he appears on the seashore, and yet he ascends into heaven. Like, you know, he has these things on his glorified, these marks on his glorified body. Is it any less glorious? You know, so I think when we look at our own, like, I think sometimes we think, well, you know, especially people who have um, disabilities or um, who have uh, deformities or things along those lines or, or people who have blemishes. Well, when I, in my glorified body, I won't have that. But ultimately, I think, what Jesus is showing us is that our salvation and our freedom and our peace come from finding healing in the midst of our brokenness. And for some of us, that's a real, that's a physical thing. Yeah. You know, coming to peace with the fact that since I've been 18 months old, I've had a huge scar on my right index finger, right? Like I've never known my body apart from that. In fact, like it would be weird to me in my glorified body if I didn't have that scar. Even so it's though not necessarily that the scars or the wounds aren't there, but we won't necessarily see them in the same light that we might see them now. Well, because we don't have shame. Right. Because shame is the first effect of the fall. When Adam and Eve sin, how does that manifest itself in shame? And so often, what are we most ashamed of? Our wounds. And those wounds are spiritual, they're emotional, they can be physical, they can also be intellectual, but our wounds are oftentimes the thing that we put between us and Jesus. And what Jesus is saying is, actually, I came for that. Like, I love meeting with um, people individually or, or couples right before they get married and to ask them, like, to, to what are you saying I do when you say I do in your marriage vows? And most of the time, people will say, I'm saying I do to the love of my life and the person who makes me the happiest and the person I want to build a family with. And that's great. That is true. There's nothing, you know, obviously I'm not married. So I <laughs> but actually you can do that anyone, can, anyone can say I do to that. That's not a mark of love. That's not a mark of charity. The I do that you're giving in Christian marriage is I do love the worst parts about you. And I choose you in that. And so, and ultimately that's a manifestation of the love that God the Father 
through God the Son has with each and every one of us. And so we're able to love better when we're, you know, and in marriage, as you both know, the more that you're able to accept your own woundedness and brokenness is the measure to which you can love the woundedness and the brokenness of others. Hmm. It's deep. What's the logic? Because uh, I, I kind of think during the Lenten season is the time of, uh, you know, repentance. And I feel like Divine Mercy Sunday is a call to repentance as well. What's What's the logic behind Divine Mercy Sunday always being the second Sunday of Easter? If I'm being totally know. honest with you, I would Did have to get look him? that up. I have no idea. Um, I figure there is some sort of intentionality behind it, but I, you know, as a Dominican friar, I, I'm not saying any. The, the Divine Mercy Chaplet and the Divine Mercy Devotion are great and wonderful things, and they are approved. But it by ain't the no church. rosary. But yes, it's not the rosary. But <laughs> so but. I honestly, I, I, I don't pray that particular devotion regularly um it's not a meaningful thing for me what a what a hard way to the, say i don't really care <laughs> but i think you know i think one of the reasons is john paul ii was very serious about rehabilitating uh saint faustina's reputation and the divine mercy devotion but i also think that we see here it is uh the divine mercy that is poured out from what? From the wounds of Christ. Mm. So when we encounter the wounds of Jesus, that leads us to, I, I, you know, it's that leads us to G, that leads us to new life in Jesus. Yeah. But one of the things that I was encouraged to do by a brother priest was uh, to repeat the words of Saint Thomas every time I celebrate Mass at the elevation of both Eucharistic species, with so the elevation of the body. And at the elevation of the blood, I say, so to voce, so no one else, you know, my Lord and my God, right? And in, in, in encountering Jesus in his woundedness, we encounter the Lord incarnate. Um, and that has to lead us to conversion of heart, mind, and life. Mm. That should lead yeah. us. All right. You got anything else on this just, gospel? Reading? Just dumb things. Okay. That's good, though. I like this woundedness piece. It's a, it's a good reminder, Father. I'm glad you're excited to preach about it. I preach about it that, every year. I just, I, it's, that says it's something so, about it. It's mm -hmm. such an amazing thing because we just we live in a world that uh, permits everything and forgives nothing. And so, anytime we run afoul of the prevailing ethos or zeitgeist, we think that somehow or another we are wounded, that beyond repair, that we are nothing. And yet, what does Jesus say to us? It's actually in our nothingness and in our brokenness that we are most loved and cherished and most open to conversion and new life. Because hmm. as St. Paul or St. John said in that second reading, when we are his beloved sons and daughters, we conquer the world. And we conquer the world through our brokenness and our strength. Beautiful. Let's do it. All right. I have dumb, I have dumb thoughts before I have dumb questions. Yeah. Can we do a quick update on last week's? uh podcast podcast cast. the cast the cast that's what the kids are calling these days <laughs> so last week jeff had this hilarious uh joke thank you for giving me credit i've been <laughs> i've been feeling a little like like my own imper my own woundedness but everyone keeps being like father meyer is hilarious and i'm like oh. that was my joke anyway go ahead sorry <laughs> Let it be so known. Father Meyer had a hilarious joke on last yep. week's show. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, Father Meyer no, he is even on the... No, he's a loyal listener and yeah. and I and heard the joke and like, but just Father Meyer did, which just made it better. Always. Yeah. Father Meyer thought it was funny. So Jeff says that he always brings uh, a case of rolling rock to an Easter party, and that's his beer of choice because the tomb is empty. Because the rock was rolled away. Do you get it? I it's love the only it. time. It's Hello. the only time every year I drink Rolling Rock is yeah. on Easter Easter weekend. So I think this is a beautiful tradition. Uh, let it be known. And Father Meyer thought it was funny, and he's but in the most Father Meyer way, just like there's no way he had that. He like right, he was like I gotta go get a twelve pack of Rolling Rock. Yeah, he called me that day and he said I was listening to the podcast and I had to pull over and get a case of Rolling Rock. And he said if it's he said it's a shame that that I don't have like social media and stuff because this would just go viral. I said, well, we can do that for you, Father. Just we send me we a know video. some people who have a social media. And then he said, 
well, I don't even know how to do that. I was like, you know how to do that. You did videos all through COVID. So then he, he mustered up the courage, sent a video, and we put it on the social media and it went viral. So here's my challenge to you, Father. What do you want to do to go viral? Let's do it. This week on the internet. I have no desires to ever go viral or to be viral. You go viral. Yeah. You actually do. You're like, you're an internet personality, whether you like it or not. Going I, make viral, no, I make no effort to be anything other than myself and that imperfectly. Yeah, but, but that's yeah, like... it's you that does it though. Your personality is that. It's you have you have an infectious personality, even when you're just mean to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's what so we're called to do. We're, we're, supposed to, uh, we're supposed to go viral for the divine mercy. Yeah. You know, I maybe maybe we can just take a, a a page out of last week's book and Jeff can come up with something that's amazing and hilarious and I can just steal it and go <laughs> viral. Uh, can we just clip you going on a rant about how Divine Mercy Sunday should be is fake and shouldn't exist? <laughs> if if you really want me to go on a rant about something, I am a Dominican. The Do you think I care about the Divine Mercy Chaplet? <laughs> no. What'd you say? The luminous mysteries. Yeah. If you really want oh. me to go off, I, I, I can go off on that front. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> we'll save it for a different one. We'll bait you into it at a different time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pass. Uh, um, okay. My dumb brain mm -hmm. things. One, if I, I, I have often thought about like Thomas and this gospel and like, it's really great. We've reflected on it before. This time while reading it, I found myself thinking, if I'm in that room and I'm in that scenario, and I would have been the one who was like, let me see him. Yeah. Let me put my finger. And then just like, put your finger here. I'm at minimum dry heaving, <laughs> possibly <laughs> vomiting, like right there as Jesus is like, put your hand in my wound. And I'm like, Ugh. like, it just, that. <laughs> I'm just thinking about that. I was like, that would be so gross. Like, uh... anyway. That was my first dumb brain thing. Second thing, which like it would maybe also be glorious. It would be <laughs> like it would do the most. <laughs> it would be just like the, a new devotion, the <laughs> devotion of the dry heave. Um, <laughs> the second father just checked he's out. Present. Yeah, no, he's not. He's yeah. just not entertained. It's just sweet. It's kind of him. Um, he's building his dissertation on the luminous mysteries. Um, I, the I other one was about that, but go ahead. <laughs> his 99 thesis about <laughs> um, when it says at the end of this gospel, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. This is one of my favorite things to just think about. Is what like, was that it? it says Jesus. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this. Book. Oh, but these are written that you may come believe. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, if they mean like in that moment in that upper room, just like what do you think? Like Jesus was with his boys, right? These were his like friends and people he loved, and like, like what other cool things do you think he was doing that like sign that like they did they couldn't tell about talk about? Like he's just like lifting them up in the air and like turning them upside down or like I don't know. Like yeah, I just never thought about those it. are things that my brain thinks about. What do you think he was doing, Father? What are you the, the other signs? Well, this I is think... like a very much a, a Talladega Nights moment. Like I like to imagine my Jesus in the upper room. <laughs> well, I, I think it's important to remember, right, that ultimately the this is an invitation to faith. And if all if we had just a list of everything that Jesus did in his life, um, without this invitation to faith, and I think that's what Saint John is getting at here. There, these are the things that. Are, that are I know that's what he's getting at, but isn't it fun to just think of like what are the other things he was doing in there? Like started juggling and then just put his hands down on his sides and the things kept going. Or like I can't I think know. I've ever I can't say that I've ever thought about that. No. Well, you should. You should. I I challenge you to relax a little bit and think about it, and maybe you'll tweet about it and it'll go viral. We'll see. We'll um, see. We'll see. We'll see. Well, thank. That's kind of you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great. Love it. I always love it's always a pleasure, Father. Uh all right. Dumb questions. Oh, we're not there yet. No, no, these are just dumb thoughts. Okay. Uh dumb questions. Uh first off, explain to a dumb lay person. That's me. Uh what what is the purpose of an amos? 
Where's well, Namus? What's that? Namus is a liturgical garment. Yeah. That... Will you explain to people what Namus is, and then yeah, is that so... the? No. 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 So an Amos is something that a priest usually, uh, in the old rite, it was required. In the new rite, it is suggested but not required. It it's a garment that the priest puts over his clerical collar, and one of the the twofold. It's it's to uh, help mop up the sweat, but also to cover his uh, priestly vestment or garments, so that whatever the only thing that you see the priest wearing is um, white, because the idea, the, the why the priest wears an alb, which literally albus in Latin means white. Um, the reason the priest wears an alb and an amos is so that it reflects the, the baptismal garments. And so historically, the amos was put over the collar um, to make sure that um, that that you didn't see the collar poking through. Now, some vestments now or albs have like the standing collar that protects that, so they're not necessarily there. It also serves as a way to um, soak up your, your sweat. But I think that one of the I was cool going to say, isn't about, that what it was developed? Like part of what it was developed for was just like. Well, yeah, in the rag. same way the maniple, which was that the priest used yeah. to wear on their left sleeve, was to wipe away their sweat. Mm. Right. So, like a lot of these things became um, uh, kind of symb symbolic, you know, they're practical and symbolic. And then the thing about the Amos, too, is that there's a prayer that the priest says before he puts it on. Uh, you know, where it talks about it being the helmet of salvation so that he can overcome the assaults of the, of the devil. So it's also a way of kind of, before you celebrate mass, putting on the helmet of salvation so that what your mind and your heart are focused on is the Lord and what you're doing as a priest in that particular moment. But they're not required. But uh, as far as I know, they are not required. I always wear yeah. one. They're not yeah. Required. No, I I remember I wanted to ask you because I knew I remembered that you wore one. And actually, you talk about the helmet of salvation, which it like doesn't go over your head. But I remember now seeing you like do that when you well, were you're supposed to kind of put it. You're supposed to drape it first over your head like you would a hood or yeah. something like that. And then you say the prayer and then you wrap it. If you're wearing a clerical collar, you wrap it around as a Dominican. We put our hood up first and then just put it over our hood. Yeah. I re I'm just sorry. I I wanted to ask about it, but I'm now remembering like having watched, like helped you like prep for mass or whatever, watching you do that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Oh, good. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, mm -hmm. I also think I, d I did. I wanted to ask about it because I did recently hear that it was like originally like basically a sweat rag and same with the maniple. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. The maniple. Yeah. Which uh, then I just giggled while you were talking about that because I was, I, my, I ended up, I had plans, or I was out Saturday, and my family went to the Easter Vigil without me, but my daughter's, like, beautiful Easter Vigil, they were so excited to see all these people coming to the church, 10 baptisms, and eight people coming to full communion, just this, like, beautiful experience, but my daughters were talking about how, as, like, on top of all of that, one of their biggest takeaways is just the they were like, maybe the sweatiest Father Tim has ever been in his life, <laughs> just in that, so much so that, like, Father John was celebrating our associate. And when Father John start, stepped up to do like his prayers during uh, the Eucharistic prayer, Father Jim stepped away to grab a rag and like do a quick wipe down and everything. Cause he just, anyway, he's a sweaty man. It's funny. Well, a lot of, you know, you think about it, the vestments that are all there, a lot of them were wool at one point. You know, we also don't think about this, but like albs that have lace in them, that's air conditioning. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just lighter vest. You know, it's not necessarily there to show off how wealthy or how ornate you can be. It's also just the reality that how much grace you were 50 years ago, 40 years ago, even most priests celebrated mass in July in tropical climates and they needed to be co as comfortable as possible without passing out or dying. Hmm. All right. My last question. Um, do you have any like beyond like these traditions of like when you're prepping for mass, do you have any like superstitions, things that you do, you know, like baseball player who puts like the, his right sock on first or something every time he gets ready for a game or like, do you have any like little things that you do that are specific to you and you just do them because like, it's part of your routine and it's your thing. And superstition is maybe a bad word for it, but either way, like just something that is unique to you. Um, I thought of this. I was, I was listening to an interview with Dan Hurley, uh, okay, great Catholic man, coach of the University of Connecticut uh, basketball team. He was talking about before each game, he has this like 
particular combination of like essential oils and holy water and stuff that in a very certain order he like sprays on him like he just he's gotten into this routine where he does these things and it helps calm him and relax him but the last one is holy water and i was like well that's pretty cool like good for him and because then he goes out on the court and screams like a banshee for uh, the entire game but i thought it was really interesting but i was wondering if like you had any things like that that were like particular to you that or that you picked I, up i don't somewhere. have really anything that would be unique or anything along that I think I, I don't think I do uh, maybe you'd have to ask people around me maybe I'm the most idiosyncratic person they know but um no they pronounce it differently but go ahead <laughs> <laughs> I for the most part just try to um have a period of quiet uh it kind of depends on the day uh, on Sundays I always try like 15 minutes before mass to have a period where I can at least run through quickly in my head the outline of a homily um and then you know i say if there's prayers that the church provides um i pray those i try to pray those prayers um yeah so i, I there's nothing i don't think there's really anything um that i that i do that would be like that where i have essential oils or things along those lines other than just mm. prayer i figured you didn't have essential oils but yeah. icy hot just chrism mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are those are the essential oils, am I right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's unfazed. It's good. <laughs> I got you with the idiosyncratic joke, though. I made you laugh. All right, that's all I got. Thanks, for resting monk face. It's nice, <laughs> great to have you, Father. Thanks for for joining us once again. Always a joy. Always a pleasure. Thank you, guys. God bless you. <laughs>